Good afternoon. I'm honored to talk with you today. Um, I've been asked to cover some developments regarding violent extremism and ways to counter it in the Lake Chad Basin region. I'm going to stick to a couple top points and then we can get into some of the detail in the conversation. Uh, before starting, I'll just simply say that I think that uh, whether it should be or not, uh, countering violent extremism is basically synonymous with fighting Islamist terrorism. And that's how I'm going to take the term. And I think that's what this panel um, is largely addressing. So I'll be talking about uh, Boko Haram and efforts to counter Boko Haram. And I've divided my talk into three parts. Um, I'll describe the Boko Haram threat. Uh, next, I will say a few words about the larger security landscape. And then I'll end by um, discussing some responses. So Boko Haram today is a movement that has evolved over several decades. I think the group's origins really lie in some Islamist trends in northern Nigeria in the late 1990s. But as a violent actor, Boko Haram has gone through four big phases, in my view, in the last 15 or so years. Uh, the first phase I would call hostile isolation. In um, this first phase, Boko Haram members had occasional clashes with Nigerian security forces while they were preaching and calling on uh, Muslim Nigerians to adopt an austere religious lifestyle and to live in secluded communities away from the rest of society. This continued till, until about uh, July of 2009, when Nigerian forces cracked down on the movement, killed and approximated 800, approximately 800 people, including the leader and founder of the group, Muhammad Yusuf, whom you see on the lower left of this slide. He was killed while in custody. Second phase started in the next year. The following year, under Abu Bakr Shekau, whom you see in the bottom center of this slide, the group reemerged as a committed, violent organization that began acquiring real competence in terrorism. They used everything from small arms to car bombs, spread attacks in the north and further south, including to the capital. It's the region in yellow on this uh, map here. And aimed at many types of targets defense and security forces, but also government buildings, villages, churches, banks, prisons, and so on. This phase, to my mind, was followed by a third of brutal insurgency. Around 2013 or so, the scattered attacks began to focus and support a push for territory. The group concentrated its strikes in three northeastern states of Nigeria, uh, Yobe, Armawa, and especially Borno. You can see them on this map. And with time, Boko Haram gained de facto control over Nigerian territory comparable about to the size of Belgium, or about half the size of Borno State. Um, it's during this time that the group declared a caliphate uh, in August of 2014, or an Islamic State. And I think since then, we've entered a fourth phase um, of Boko Haram's evolution, starting around 2015, which I've called deadly disintegration. In the last couple of years, we've seen Boko Haram start to come apart under a number of pressures, including counterterrorism efforts. The group has lost land. It's experienced defections. It's seen the liberation of people that it had kidnapped, including some of the Chibuk girls, whom I'm sure you've heard about. And it suffered an important split. Um, in August of 2016, Khaled al-Barnawi, whom you see in the lower right of this slide, has taken a faction of the group under the name the Islamic State in West Africa province. But I would say that this disintegrating group remains deadly, particularly with cross-border attacks affecting the neighbors, Cameroon, Chad, Niger. And it's had a sustained use of suicide bombers, especially attacks with uh, girls and kids, and so on. So this is how Boko Haram as a threat has evolved. As for the drivers that lead individuals to join or to tolerate Boko Haram, um, I think they, we see in them um, a standard uh, set of the push and full, pull factors that we just heard about in the earlier presentation. Um, in terms of pull, we see offers of status, of opportunity, of purpose. In terms of push, we see social ills like impunity, abuse, uh, relative deprivation, and so on. There may be, and research suggests that there may be some 
specific drivers uh, that are related to Islamist terrorist movements uh, for Boko Haram and elsewhere on the continent, uh, things having to do with ideological appeal or the importance of a so-called religious figure in radicalizing. But basically, the sets of drivers that um, motivate and, and sustain Boko Haram are, are quite similar to other uh, Islamist terrorist groups on the continent. Let me say a couple words now about costs. Boko Haram has exacted direct and indirect costs. In terms of direct costs, they include death and injury, uh, destruction of you know, office buildings, infrastructure, bus terminals, and so on. Displacement, I think this is an underappreciated aspect of the challenge. Two to three million people probably displaced from this conflict alone, both internally and across borders. And obviously disruption of everyday life, um, disrupting schools, disrupting market life, and so on. There are also indirect costs that should be kept in mind. Economic losses. It's hard to attract foreign investment or to have tourism under circumstances of conflict and violence like this. There have also been some worsened social divisions and conflicts, arguably exacerbated by Boko Haram's presence and attacks. And above all, I want to emphasize some challenges that come with state violence and certain forms of repression. It has to be said that in the Lake Chad Basin region, as elsewhere on the continent, terrorism has elicited very violent reactions at times, and at times that's victimized citizens uh, of the zone. So to see some of these costs, I've taken some data from the Council on Foreign Relations Nigeria Security Tracker, which has been tracking the conflict since May of 2011. I'll give you two graphs from that data. Here's the first. Here you can see the number of casualties and their uh, particular intensity during the brutal insurgency period. You see monthly casualty rates that are particularly high in the 2013 to 2015 period, several months that experienced more than 2,000 deaths. And you also see the overall rising cumulative death count, which in this data set stands at 53,039. This graph shows the same data arranged by the perpetrator of violence, which serves to show that it's not just Boko Haram uh, that has been identified as behind um, the casualty count. So I think the th three key lines I'd like to focus on here is the top, the blue, which is deaths caused by state actors. Orange is deaths by Boko Haram. And brown represents deaths in clashes between the state and Boko Haram. And as you can see, um, according to this data set, they found that the state alone has been responsible for 7,202 citizen deaths since May of 2011. So how can we account for the dynamics of such intense violence. I'd like to turn now a little bit to the context in which this uh, violence is taking place. The first thing I want to point out is that since 2012 or 2013, uh, the Boko Haram crisis has become a cross-border affair. And it's implicated four quite different uh, countries in Africa. Nigeria, Cameroon, Niger, and Chad. And I just want to take a couple minutes to content ourselves with uh, the idea that we have some idea about some major differences among those, those countries. So I put up just some basic facts to remind us about some of these key differences. You know, Nigeria is Africa's most populous country with an estimated 191 million inhabitants. It's largely a Muslim uh, Hausa Fulani north, uh, has been long balanced by a Christian south. And in Nigeria, the Boko Haram conflict has been largely centered around Maiduguri, and the Lake Chad area in the northeast. Cameroon, Nigeria's eastern neighbor, is about half of Nigeria's side, but only has an eighth of its population. It is a predominantly Christian nation, and the Boko Haram conflict here has been largely affecting the discrete far north, the north and far north areas of that country, and, uh, which is a predominantly Muslim um, area. Niger. There we go. Uh, Niger, Nigeria's northern uh, neighbor. Meanwhile, I would say it looks something like an extension of 
Nigeria's north in its uh, characteristics in that it's mainly a Muslim and Hausa country. Yet Niger is much larger, more rural, and has only 1 15th of Nigeria's population density. So it's a much vaster and less populous country. And it's facing several terrorist challenges in the west and in the north. And Boko Haram is a largely part of a challenge in the far east for this country, in the Difa region. Then finally, Chad, Nigeria's northeastern neighbor, is as large as Niger, but has even fewer people. But nevertheless, it's been, the Boko Haram challenge has been quite important for Chad, um, particularly because its capital city, N'Djamena, where a tenth of Chadians live, is actually quite close to the lake and the conflict. Um, and its population centers have been directly impacted by Boko Haram. In fact, uh, Maiduguri is three times closer to N'Djamena than it is to the capital of Nigeria, Abuja. Hmm. So these are um, some factors shaping uh, how this conflict affects the different countries um, in this area that share this zone of the Lake Chad. Uh, so this conflict sits at a crossroads of very different states, and it has uh, connected to very different existing dynamics and tensions within these countries. Um, in various ways, Boko Haram is fed on the environmental changes that are creating hardship for Lake Chad's fishing and farming communities. Uh, Lake Chad has lost about 90% of its water since the 1960s. You can see from these five images in the middle of this slide the reduction of the water in Lake Chad. Um, agricultural belts are also shifting um, further south with desertification and increasing conflict between herders and farmers over land use in the region. Uh, Boko Haram is also um, leveraged different socioeconomic disparities within communities, long-standing ethno-religious fault lines, and some deep cultural differences, uh, both historic and emerging. I think we can think about the different life prospects and experiences for those who are living, for example, in Lagos, which you see here, Africa's largest city on Nigeria's southern coast, and those who are uh, living in remote rural villages in the northeast, literally thousands of kilometers away. And above all, I think Boko Haram has persisted through some enduring political challenges within these nation states and some policy decisions and security actions about how to handle the conflict. So I'd like to turn now to my third and final part to talk about some of the responses to Boko Haram. There we go. Um, of course, major efforts and considerable resources have been dedicated to combating Boko Haram. I'm not going to go into the specifics here, but we can discuss them in the conversation. I'll simply note that approaches have evolved. Um, they have now come to include countering violent extremism, extremism and um, quote unquote soft approaches, along with kinetic and hard approaches. They've also come more and more to uh, involve regional cooperative efforts in addition to national efforts. The multinational joint task force is a good example of that. Um, there have been a lot of successes. We can talk about those. Uh, but there are also some areas for improvement, in my view. I'll mention a couple. First and foremost has to do with addressing abuses. Um, I put a picture here of a prisoner who is being mistreated by Cameroonian soldiers, an image that comes from a recent Amnesty International study of abuses in a couple of detention centers. Um, the main one is Salak Airfield. I would encourage all of you to take a look at this report and especially to watch the video on the website, which does a powerful job of using victim testimony and social media images to show that abuses are taking place and that international actors, uh, likely US personnel, are also uh, present and um, likely aware. And the Pentagon has launched an investigation into this case after this report was released in July. Second uh, is the challenge of vigilantes. I would just say on the last one, uh, I chose this example because it's a recent report. I could have chosen examples from other countries also involved, and it's not unique to one country. Just took it as a, um, a case, as an example. Second, I think there is a uh, challenge with vigilantes. As you may have heard and know, uh, Boko Haram, uh, in, in countering Boko Haram, Nigeria and other Lake Chad Basin countries have at times tolerated um, sometimes sanctioned, on occasion even mobilized and armed civilian groups to fight uh, the terrorist group. Um, these vigilante watch groups can 
uh, sometimes lack proper training and accountability mechanisms, and they can eventually emerge as an interest group, an armed interest group in their own right, which can raise questions about uh, their future and the future security implications. The International Crisis Group has released a number of reports this year on this topic that I would uh, encourage you to look at. The last one uh, that my colleague also mentioned has to do with reintegration. There's, I think, a lot left to be done um, for finding ways for those who have been involved, often forcibly, uh, with Boko Haram, especially women and children, to find a way out of the group. This involves both the state and society coming to grips with millions who have been affected by Boko Haram and state violence over the past decade. Let me conclude with a couple thoughts about recommendations, and I'll just share some ideas that have come out of the work that we've been doing uh, here over a number of years. First has to do with the value of developing a strategy. Using strategic logic, as we've been talking about in this course, can help countries and services um, avoid reactive responses and help to align its actions with the nation's true security needs. Second recommendation, training for defense and security forces on countering violent extremism. It can be useful for those forces to understand um, how they can <coughs> contribute to, but also how they can avoid contributing to uh, the persistence of terrorism uh, in the region. Third, demand positive partnerships. I think it's important that uh, African nations find ways of leveraging outside interest in ways that serve their own national interests and reinforce the rule of law um, and reinforce defense and security priorities. And then the fourth and kind of overarching point is simply the point about working for citizen security. To my mind, overcoming Boko Haram is ultimately part of the long struggle to reorient security forces for the good of human beings, not for um, other structures or small groups um, of people. And I think that's a reality for Africa, but also um, everywhere. So to finish, I thought I'd put a picture of this uh, young woman. Her name is Salamatu Bulama came from a report that I was reading. Uh, she was kidnapped by Boko Haram. When Nigerian forces came uh, near the Sambisa forest to liberate uh, those and to fight uh, those who had been taken and to fight Boko Haram, uh, she stayed uh, away from Boko Haram to try to be um, part of those who were liberated. During that time, the girls were pelted, those who decided to make this effort, pelted by rocks uh, by the militants who were retreating. Several of them died. Um, when forces arrived, um, unfortunately, it was unclear to some of them that they were people trying to be liberated, and some of them were killed. And she was interviewed um, a couple of years ago for this report uh, in an IDP camp. So I think we should be thinking about how security in the Boko Haram case and others like it uh, can be oriented to serve people like her, and how security cooperation should also support that goal. And as emerging leaders, I think you have a part in making that happen. Thank you.